Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the honor of being able to gather in the name of your Son. And for even our being here, a testimony to you and to your mercy. So for your presence as we gather in your name, we thank you. And for allowing us, God, to be a part of what it is that you are doing. We give you the praise and the thanks. And so form in us, God, that which you desire. Work in us that which you command. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before um, I get into the sermon, I want to give a very small shout out to Amber Duncan, who with her and the congregation of St. Paul Shreveport cannot be with us but are watching this live streamed even as we speak in prayer and thanksgiving for Sean Duncan's ordination. And so you're a part of us even though you're not here and we're really glad that you're with us. I have a small confession to make. I love the hymns that have been printed and that we've been singing. It's almost like a personal favorite hits list. But I must confess to you that the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, wasn't one of my favorites, especially growing up. I still remember singing that hymn as a middle schooler and we're getting along, and I'm singing it along, and then we get to that line that says, uh, take my voice and let me sing, always only for my king. And I never sang that verse. <laughs> I just, all of a sudden, my lips went just like this. And why? <laughs> I wanted to sing rock and roll. <laughs> and I wasn't at all, at all sure that you could sing rock and roll always only for my king. And in fact, at that point in my life, there was this kind of interior negotiation between an inner life that I knew was far from holy, I mean, to say the least, and the persona that I presented, particularly among my church friends and the people that I knew. It was this inner life that was one thing and the outer life that was another. I really didn't learn actually until much later, the advice to do whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God, and that it really was possible with a certain intelligent selectivity to even sing rock and roll to the glory of God. Boom shakalaka. <laughs> but you see, I share that story because I think there are many of us that wrestle with that kind of interior exterior disparity. We want to do the right thing, but yet inside there are other things that are going on that we know that don't feel right at all. And either we get to the point to where we justify in our minds, because we are very clever people, the things that inside that we inherently know are wrong or we try to find a way to negotiate the disparity in some way. And especially if we're doing the latter, we become extraordinarily good actors. No one actually really knows what's going on in our inner life. But what that puts us into is a kind of trap. Uh, it's the trap that makes above everything the desire to be received thought well of, so that the acting is not just a manner of somehow trying to cover up, it's also a way of figuring out a personal kind of presentation of one's self. And especially when that, get, that gets sort of into the life of the church, it really does show up in the very things that Jesus speaks against, about lording it over, because the desire is always to look better than and then you fill in the blank, whomever those people might be. 
In other words, to have that interior brokenness between the exterior, exterior life and the interior life automatically takes you not just to acting, but a kind of pecking order in your mind as to who is and who is not particularly acceptable. And that can actually even begin to translate into how church gets organized in terms of who you want around you because you want people to make you look good. And even the way you organize the liturgy where it becomes more focused around performance than rather the matter of the heart because you see I can't share, even though before whom all hearts are open, everything in the, the public assembly in my God where it leads me is to become in, not just an actor but a choreographer and a desire to make sure that what we're doing on Sunday is done what? Right. Which is actually the way I want it, you see. It's an extraordinarily powerful trap and takes me very far away to the call of servanthood, which is not only the essence of the gospel, but certainly the essence of diaconal ministry. You who in a very specific way are called to embody the servanthood not only of Jesus, but the servanthood into which we are all called and invited as baptized Christians. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Sisters and brothers, that question, that I will, is quite impossible. Quite impossible. So long as you are wrestling with the exterior and interior disparity. You're actually exercising way too much energy in your own brain to try to negotiate your relationships and your public responsibilities and trying to wrestle with the implications of your private life and you're dealing with things in your relationships and because there's all that kind of interior spin going on, inevitably you will want to hang out with the people that feel easier. There is no room in your life for sacrifice because there's only so much energy to go around. And guess where you're spending most of it? It's on you. Paul puts his finger right on it at the beginning of the Corinthian lesson when he says, therefore it is by God's mercy that we exercise this ministry. Because a person caught in that trap would say, even if they might not ever say it out loud, Therefore, it is by my capacity to keep a well-ordered life that I exercise this ministry. The difference could not be more profound. So to enter into that place of servanthood, to be willing to live in the kind of sacrificial life to which we are called, I have to go back to that middle school kid and say, there's a new hearing of the gospel that needs to happen. You need to know that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin, not just the ones you can control. You need to learn that the power of the Holy Spirit can break into the deepest recesses, the darkest places of your life, and shed light where there was only shame and fear. You need to know that to be received into Jesus is to be received precisely and including all that you are, and that God is on an eternal game plan, not next week, to so work in you the very nature of a Christ that, again, going back to the lesson, that the life of Jesus is manifested in you. You see, the goal of the Christian life is not to be the best Episcopalian you know, or the best deacon or priest, or God forbid, the best bishop. But, that, but it's always Jesus. It is his life, his focus, his center. The plumb line of his life is that into which we are invited, not somehow that I might aspire to it, because that would only produce, again, despair, but instead that I might begin to receive something from him that I have never received, at least consciously, before. You see, it's not about inviting Jesus into your life, but accepting Jesus' invitation to yield to his life in you.
the difference is significant. To invite Jesus into my life means I've kind of got it all together and I need him to help me to be me and to do what I can to order what is going on in my life. <laughs> to yield to the invitation of Jesus to be somehow yielded into his life means all bets of self-control, except for that which somehow helps us with sin, is all those bets are off. Everything becomes at his disposal. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what we have, no matter what we don't have, it's all on the table. And if Jesus is committed to forming his life in and through us, I have to tell you that he is extraordinarily both patient and relentless. He is patient because he knows he has all of eternity to work this out inside of us. So even if we have some kind of fall down and knock down, which we will, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. None of that actually in the end so casts out God's eternal plan for us because it really is not by works, not by works and particularly by my power to be perfect. <laughs> but that he will continue to pull the curtain back, he will continue to go into places in my life that sometimes I wish he wouldn't, quite honestly, because there are things about my life, even though they might not be all that right, that I actually like. That's the hard part. But if it's about servanthood, slave, as the translation was read in the epistle today, then that means the capacity to yield, which even there I need to receive from him as sheer gift. But as that yieldedness is in fact being worked in me, as the life of Jesus is being manifested through me, even if it's only in small ways extraordinary, extraordinary things begin to happen. There is about this, and I know I've said this before, but I can't, I can't get over it. There is this wonder about all this that occasionally I look around and say, God, how did I get in on this? I mean, there's a kind of unbridled joy in actually having some role, some of which we see, some of which we don't in a way that actually makes an eternal difference in the life of another person or an institution, in a neighborhood, in the places where we live and serve. Because you see, that's where the life of Jesus is meant to go. There is, in fact, a reason for why we do the gospel procession the way we do. It is meant to be a symbol of really two things. First of all, in a very clear way, the diaconal role that comes into the midst of the people with the proclamation of the gospel. But the, the focus is not merely on the deacon and that which the deacon is reading, because it's not as if somehow the deacon goes over there where nobody's sitting. The deacon goes right into dead center. So who's there? You and me. And it's not just that we're there. We actually are there representing the families, the institutions, the cultures, and the life that we live almost all the time when we're not in here. I had this vision not long ago, and it just took my breath away, of somebody coming into the center of the church, reading the gospel, and here were all of us, but I didn't just see individuals, I saw the institutions they represented. BB&T Bank, Publix Supermarket, law firms, police departments, neighborhoods. And just as the gospel is read in the midst of the people and we receive it, we actually receive it as representatives of those institutions into which God has placed us that we might also be the ones who, as servants of the living God, go into those institutions and into those places with the very word and the life that we have received. It's not just somehow a private word that's spoken to us as individuals because we're the gathered. That's not what this symbol means. This symbol has to do with Christ in the midst of the world, the world we represent by virtue of who we are, where we work, our families, our background, our education, and all that we are. 
You see, it's a servanthood, but it is in fact an evangelistic servanthood. There is a reason that Philip is held up in a very particular way. And Stephen and others who went out with the gospel in the book of Acts after the formation of this diaconal ministry. Because, you see, the essence of servanthood is taking in a way that can only be inspired by God the gospel into those places where, in fact, it may not be well received. Why do you think that as the life of Jesus is being manifested, what Paul begins to say in a way that I wish he wouldn't, he said, what, as the life of God is being manifested, we begin to see the extraordinary power belongs to God and not from us. And so what happens to us? We are afflicted in every way. We are but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. You know, that's not going to happen in a pew at the Cathedral Church of St. Luke. <laughs> Although there are some churches that come close. No, no, no. What Paul is talking about is taking the gospel into the arena of culture, law, the arts, life, politics, business. Can we please get over somehow that what's supposed to happen is that the leaders lead and the congregation congregates? But instead, can we understand that what is being acted out in this kind of divine drama of salvation itself is the exploration, the demonstration of a call, both on these deacons as servant evangelists, but also among us who hear and receive that word, that we might also say, praise to you, Lord Christ, not just because I get to hear, but because I've been called to give it, to serve it to give it away, to be a channel for that which I have already received. You can't do that if you don't know God's mercy, because you'll be too afraid of messing it up. You'll still be too caught into, I want to look good, so I don't want to take those risks. And if that fear is what grips you, then you need to have a talk with God about the very nature of His mercy. Lord, it is clear I actually have not heard in the depths of my soul the gospel that is being proclaimed. I still too much want to look good in a way that keeps me from being the servant that I've been called to be. So deacons, This is not easy work, but I sure wouldn't want to do anything else. It means that no matter where you are, whether you're wearing a cross or not, or a collar or not, you are still there, whether that be in the bank or at Publix at the ATM or the local restaurant, you're still there always, only for my king. So that whatever you do, you do for the glory of God. And always looking for those opportunities, even if it's in the smallest of ways, to be a servant, a servant of Jesus. Because that's what the world needs desperately. And we have been given a treasure to pass along. Welcome to this ministry. Amen.